pastors at River Rock Church down in Colorado, uh, Colorado Springs. And then also he is a CBC instructor here. So I know his word is going to bless you today. Amen. Amen. Always fun to be here. So <laughs> today I want to talk about receiving from God is easy. Sometimes people find it difficult to receive from the Lord for if it be healing, if it be financial provision, or anything else that they're looking for, sometimes it finds it's difficult. But actually, let's look in the Word and find out how easy it is to receive from God. Amen. Let's start with Hebrews 6.1. Hebrews 6.1 says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. And so, when we look at the New Testament, we're going to find out that faith is always connected to the person of God the Father or the Lord Jesus Christ. And so really New Testament faith is rooted in a person, in a relationship, not necessarily or primarily for things. Yes, we exercise our faith in things, but primarily faith, biblical faith is rooted in a person, and especially understanding a loving relationship with the one you're trusting. And so look at Hebrews 12, look at verse 2, we're going to find that uh, that the Lord Jesus Christ is the source of faith. Look at Hebrews 12, verse 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Here, Jesus is the author of faith. That means he's the source of faith. Well, Pastor, I thought that the Word was the source of faith. Hearing, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word. Well, Jesus is the Word of God. Mm -hmm. And so He's the author and the completer of faith. He's the end result of faith. And so, it really, the more you find yourself looking at Jesus, the more you're going to find yourself in faith. And so, Jesus is the source and the object of biblical faith. Look at Luke 6. Look at verse 17. We're going to look at some examples in Jesus' ministry where people received healing. We're going to find out how did they have faith for healing. Look at Luke 6, look at verse 17. And this, this says, He, Jesus, came down with them and stood on a level place with a crowd of His disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea, Jerusalem, and from the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon who came to hear Him and be healed of their diseases. Mm -hmm. Most of all, first of all, they came to hear Him. And be healed of their diseases. Mm. I want you to see something. Their faith was more in the healer than in healing. Mm. And so when they heard him, their faith was in him, and healing was easy. They received that so simply. People struggle receiving healing because they're trying to believe for healing instead of placing their faith in the healer. That's good. And so let me say something. I'll say it several times during this, this lesson. A faith problem is a relationship problem. Mm -hmm. Let me say it again. A faith problem is a relationship problem. There's a lack of knowing and trusting in the Father and the G in Jesus and the true nature of God. Look in Galatians 5. Look at verse 6. It's a famous verse, Galatians 5, 6. It says, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. When I was young, I was taught that this says that my faith would work with how, and deter, my faith working is determined how much I loved people. But actually, that's not what this verse is saying. What's this verse saying? Your faith works to the level you know God loves you. And as you're receiving the love of God, then your confidence in the Lord increases. You can't trust someone you don't know. You don't have any confidence in them. If, you know, if you're standing outside and and uh, someone says, well, do you want to go in there? I'll hold your wallet while you go in there. It's like, <laughs> no, I don't know you. You're not going to hold my wallet or my purse or, you know. Right. It says, we, you have confidence in someone you know. Mm -hmm. And the more we know the heart of the Father, the, know the Lord Jesus Christ, the more our faith works. And so you'll always struggle in faith if you don't know and doubt God's love for you. And so the new covenant is based upon a trusting relationship with God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ based on knowing them. Look in John 17, look at verse 3. John 17, 3 says, And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. Here we find eternal life is not so much a duration, but it's a quality. It's a relationship. And it says that they may know you. I want to look at us, some other verses that, talk, that ties faith to a relationship. Look in 2 Timothy 1, look at verse 12. This is Paul, the Apostle. 
Paul says, For this reason I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. And I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I was committed to him to that day. So Paul's faith was in the relationship with the person of God. He says, I know whom I believed, and I'm persuaded he is able. And so when you know who you're trusting, faith is easy. Mm -hmm. And so look at Hebrews 11, 11. This is Sarah. And Sarah is believing for a miracle uh, to have a child when she's past age. She's gone through menopause. Mm -hmm. I don't know why they don't call it womenopause. But anyway, <laughs> it's menopause. And so, it, so she was barren to start with. So this is a double miracle. Mm -hmm. But look in Hebrews 11, 11. How did she receive the miracle of having a baby at 90 years old? And so it says, by faith Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed. She bore a child when she was past age because. Mm -hmm. We're just about to find out. How did she receive this miracle? How did her faith become strong to receive strength to conceive seed? Because she judged him faithful. She judged him faithful mm -hmm. who had promised. And so the more you know him, you can judge him faithful. Mm -hmm. And it's easy to receive the promise. Look at Acts 27, look at verse 25. This is Paul in a shipwreck. He's a storm. You might be going through a storm in your life. Mm -hmm. And so Paul was going through a storm in his life. It looked like the ship was going to go down. It looks like they're all going to die. But in the middle of the night he had a message from God. I want you to see what he says in Acts 27, 25. He says, Therefore take heart, men, for I believe God. I believe God. That it should be just as he told me. He just says, I don't, I have faith for the ship making it. He says, I have faith in God. I believe him. I believe his character. He said it. I trust him. Mm -hmm. And they were safe. And so I just want to make this statement having faith in God makes receiving things easy. Mm -hmm. Having a knowledge of God, his heart, his nature, makes things re receiving from it very easy. Look in Mark 11:23. You might say this is Copenhagen 23. This is <laughs> Kenneth Copen and Kenneth Hagen, but they didn't write this verse. <laughs> and so this is actually Jesus saying this in Mark 11, 23. Jesus said, For surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast in the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but, but leaves those things, he says, will be done. He will have whatever he says. Look at verse 24. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe you receive them, and you shall have them. Well, Pastor, you just told me faith is not rooted primarily in things. You're right. Move, faith to move mountains and faith to receive things from God is predicated actually in verse 22. I started with verse 23 and read verse 24. But it's all predicated on the foundation of verse 22. Let's look at Mark 11:22. What does it say? Mark 11:22 says, So Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God. Have faith in God. Mm -hmm. And when you understand God, moving mountains is easy, receiving things is easy. I know we all like things. We like to live in a thing. We want a bigger thing to live in. <laughs> we drive a thing. We want to drive a bigger thing. <laughs> but you know what? Things are so easy to receive when you have the confidence in God. That's good. And so here we see faith in relation to moving mountains and receiving things is based on a relationship. And so we're, we're, uh, I'm going to bring out the fact that it's easy for children to receive from their parents mm -hmm. when they know the parents' love. Right. When there's been consistency from birth that, that that child's been loved, he's been protected, he's been provided for, there would be a problem if you saw a, a, a child uh, fearfully walking into the living room where the father was mm -hmm. and just fearfully walking in going, Oh, Father, Oh, Father, Oh, Father, Oh, Father, Oh, Father. He who dwells on the couch between the two lampstands. <laughs> Will you please, please, please provide food for me tonight? Please. Okay, there's a major problem in the relationship. Something's off. Yeah. Well, I've just told you how many Christians go before God begging and pleading for things, having faith for things, and they don't have an understanding of the heart of the Father. Mm, that's good. And so look in Luke 11. Look at verses 11 and 12. This is Jesus speaking. He's going to relate receiving from God based on a loving relationship. Look at, a, look at 11, Luke 11, 11. It says, If a son asks for bread, will any father among you give him a stone? Well, Father, can I have a piece of bread? Uh, no, but here's a rock. Enjoy that. We'll take you to the dentist, maybe. Mm -hmm. It says, Will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? 
Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Another Gospel says, how, if you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much will your heavenly Father give good gifts to His children? Here Jesus relates receiving from the Father based on His goodness based on a relationship, a loving relationship, knowing the love of the Father and receiving is easy. And so, let's look at some healings that came forth. How did they get healed? And it was so simple. It was not a difficult time for them to receive healing under Jesus' ministry. Why? Look in Acts chapter 3, look at verse 11. Before we get to Jesus' examples, let's look at Peter in the book of Acts chapter 3. We're going to see in verse 11 <clears throat> that the lame man at the gate beautiful was healed. And so, Acts 3.11 it says, Now the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John. All the people ran together to them on the porch, which was called Solomon's, greatly amazed. So when Peter saw it, he responded to the people, men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why do you look so intently at us? As though by our own power or our own godliness that we made this man walk. It was his name through faith in His name that has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, it's faith that came through Him or by Him has given Him the perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Here it says it was faith in Jesus. Jesus Peter didn't say, yeah, it was great, my great faith for miracles. It was my great faith for healing. No, it says my great faith in Jesus the healer. And so, in His character. And so, look at uh, in Matthew chapter 9. This is Jesus' ministry. Look at the two blind men getting healed in Matthew 9. Look at verse 27. Matthew 9, 27, And when Jesus departed from there, two blind men followed Him, crying out, saying, Son of David, have mercy on us. And when He had come into the house, the blind men came to Him. And Jesus said to them, Do you have faith for healing? Oh, I'm sorry, that's a clueless translation. That is not what that says. What did he say? Do you believe that I am able mm -hmm. to do that? And they said, Yes, Lord. And he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, let it be to you. It was their faith that brought healing, but what was their faith anchored in? Was it faith for healing? Mm -hmm. Was it faith to get healed of the blindness? No, it was faith in his ability. It was in the faith of Jesus. And then receiving came so simply because they had faith in the healer. So, let's look at the leper in Matthew 8. Look at verse 2. Matthew 8, look at verse 2. It says, Behold, a leper came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus put out his hand and touched him and said, I am willing. Be cleansed. Immediately his leprosy cleansed. See, this leper was healed by faith in Jesus' willingness to heal. It wasn't his great faith in healing. Right. It was knowing the willingness of the Savior that enabled that miracle to take place. Mm. Now let's look at the paralytic that was left through the roof by his friends. Um, let's look at Luke chapter 5, look at verse 20. Luke 5, look at verse 20. They're showing examples of Jesus. I can show you many more, but we don't have time for this study. Luke 5, look at verse 20. And when Jesus saw their faith, He said to, said to the man on the, on the mat, or on the that was stretched out, man, your sins are forgiven you, and that you may know the Son of Man, verse 24, that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man that was paralyzed, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Immediately he rose up before them, took up what he had been laying on, and departed to his own house. Notice this man's faith wasn't tied to his to, for healing. It was tied on knowing he's forgiven. Mm. He knew that God had forgiven him. Knew Jesus had forgiven him. Knew that there was nothing. He was a right relationship with God. And when it was there, there was a confidence there, just to simply receive and to get up and be healed. Mm. And so I want to talk about faith. And I grew up in the faith word of faith movement. And so on the fringe of the word of faith movement in the 80s and 90s. Uh, and it started really in the 70s. But uh, on the fringe of the movement of the Word of Faith movement, there's an error. And one of the errors was that they taught you need to have faith in faith. You need to have faith in your faith. Well, I'm sorry, that's ignorance gone to seed. Faith is not the object of your faith. Faith is not the source of your faith. And so, Jesus is the source of faith. 
And so the more you look at faith to try to examine it to, and to have confidence in it, it will shrivel. Mm -hmm. But as the more you look at Jesus, look at His finished work, look at His love, the more you receive from His grace, the more faith becomes robust. Mm -hmm. It just comes out of nowhere, grabs hold of the very thing and takes it. But if you're looking and examining how much faith, do you have enough faith, it's going to be crippled. Mm -hmm. And so many again are trying to have confidence, they have enough faith to receive from God, they're focused on their faith, trying to measure its strength and effectiveness. And so that's called having faith in faith. Mm -hmm. And you're never called to have faith in faith, you have to have faith in a person, his name's Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so when you hear about Jesus, faith is the natural byproduct. You don't need to focus on your faith. And so hopefully you've seen today in this study that biblical faith is directly tied to the person of Jesus and that any trouble with faith is a relationship issue. And so if you're having trouble receiving something you're believing for, go back and spend time with the source. Spend time with God the Father. Spend time with the Lord Jesus Christ. Get to know His character, His nature, and His love for you. Especially understand His love for you. Well, Pastor, you told me that receiving is easy when I, when I grow in my relationship with God and know Him better. How do I know Him better? I'm glad you asked. Let's talk about how do you develop your relationship with God in the remaining time that we have. Mm -hmm. And so, first of all, you're going to get to know anybody is by spending time with them. Mm -hmm. And so, just sitting an, uh, five hours beside someone silently, you're not going to learn anything from right. them. Mm -hmm. How do you actually learn from someone? Through their words. Mm -hmm. It's through talking. That's when they're communicating their heart, their thoughts, their values. And so it's by their words. It's the same thing with God. How will you know God in a greater way? You know Him through His words. Mm -hmm. And so look at John 14, look at verse 7. Jesus said this, If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on you know Him and have seen Him. Do you want to know how the Father is like? No, look at Jesus. Amen. Jesus is what I call perfect theology. Mm -hmm. Theology is the study of God, the nature of God. If you want to know God the Father, look at Jesus because they are exactly the same nature, the same likeness. And so, if you look at Jesus in His ministry, did He turn people away? Did He reject people that needed help from Him? Did He ever turn someone away that needed healing? Mm -hmm. Did He ever take out a clipboard with 15 pages uh, for them an assessment for their healing. No, sir. Okay, so what sin were you involved in? Have you repented of that? So what sins of your ancestors and everybody else and click off on the trip? No, he just simply healed them. Amen. And then if they were in sin, then he said, you know, you need to repent. Yeah. But he didn't not hope, say, well, you repent first and then I heal you. No, grace comes first mm -hmm. and then we respond. And so if you want to know God, the Father, get to know Jesus. How do you get to know Jesus? Through the Word. You wouldn't know how to spell Jesus without the Word of God. And so, so go into the, and, and find out how Jesus is and you're going to find it. Next of all I want to talk about and spend a good amount of time on this point is you get to know God by experiencing His love. Mm. By experiencing His love. And so for years I wanted to experience God's love. But Aaron I was always looking for love in the wrong places. Mm -hmm. I will spare you me singing the song. I almost want to sing it. Well, they might like it. You might like it. <laughs> Looking for love in all the wrong places. I sung that at church one day. I said, Jeremy, my worship leader, can I get into the band now? And he goes, <laughs> yeah. no, you can't. No way. We look for love in the wrong places. And so I was always looking for love in my emotions. Mm. I was checking my emotions to feel love. That's good. And so, you know, there's times in a worship service where everything's lined up and you feel the love of God, but most of the time I wasn't feeling God's love. Mm -hmm. And I was like that guy with the, you know, with the, the flower, she loves me, she loves me not, she loves me, she loves me not. And so, that's the way Christians are. And so, if you go by your emotions, most of the time you think, well, God's love is not there and God's love for me has waned and it's waxed and it's not the same as it was. And, and so, your emotions is a wrong place to look to experience God's love. The worst, I'm going to tell you the worst place to try to find God's love. The worst barometer for how God feels about you at any given time is your, your circumstances. Mm. Because welcome to life. Life is up, life is down. Mm -hmm. If you're up and down with circumstances, you're going to be a yo-yo Christian. Mm -hmm. And so you'll be up and down with circumstances. And a lot of times when you're getting hit by the enemy, it doesn't look like anything's going right. 
all of a sudden you're like, where is God? He feels a thousand miles away. Maybe he doesn't love me or love me as much. And what have I done to make that love go away? It's the worst barometer. Okay, so now we looked at the wrong places. Let's look at the only right place to find and to experience God's love. There is a biblical way to experience God's love anytime you want to experience it, 24-7, 365 days a year. On purpose, you can experience God's love. But it has to be done through the biblical way, the pathway to do it. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to lay the biblical foundation for experiencing God's love anytime you need to. And so I want you to look at Romans 5, look at verse 8. I'm not going to give you two or three in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word establish. I'm going to give you multiple verses mm. to show you this. This is the biblical way to experience the love of God. So look at Romans 5, look at verse 8. It says, but God demonstrates his own love towards us. Let me stop there. Look at the word demonstrates. In the Greek, it's a present tense verb. God is demonstrating, 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 always demonstrating his own love towards us. And while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's the pathway to understanding and experiencing the fresh demonstration of his love is you go back to the cross. Mm -hmm. It was what Jesus did at the cross in his redemption for you is death, burial, and resurrection. That's where you find the love of God demonstrated. And if you'll go back to that, focus on what he did for you at the cross, you'll experience the love of God coming up through your spirit into your soul, and you'll experience a fresh new understanding of the love of God for you. So let's go on to other verses that show us this is the pathway to understanding God's love. Look at first look at first John three, look at verse sixteen. First John three, <clears throat> look at verse sixteen. It says, by this we know love. By this we know love. Look at this word know. It's the Greek word gnosko. The word gnosko in the Greek means to know by experience. We talked about how can you experience the love of God. Okay, this is here. By this we know by experience love because he laid down his life for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Go to 1 John 4, look at verse 9 and 10. 1 John 4, look at verse 9 and 10. In this is the love of God. In this the love of God was manifested towards us, that God had sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. Verse 10, in this is love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be a propitiation for our sins on the cross. Mm -hmm. You want to experience the love of God? Focus on what He did for you at the cross. And let's keep reading. John 15, look at verse 13. This is Jesus speaking. Jesus said, greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for his friends. And so, no greater love. And so, let me bring this out. I think it's very, very important that you put the magnifying lens of God's love over your life and over your heart. Because it's easy to say, yeah, Jesus died for billions of people. No, he died for you. In a God way, I can't explain it. On the cross, he died just for you. Mm -hmm. and, and he suffered just for you. But let's talk about what he suffered for you. And so, first of all, that suffering did not start on the cross. It actually started when he was caught in the Garden of Gethsemane and just the, the anguish he went through uh, knowing that he would become sin and be cut off from his father from eternity. He did that for you. And then he went through a trial before, before uh, the Sanhedrin. And they, they beat him with their fists. They slapped him. They spit in his face. They pulled his beard out, and they did all that for you. Jesus allowed that because of you, for you. And then he went before Pilate, and Pilate wanted to wash his hands clean of it, but he knew he couldn't, and so he was forced to hand him over. And so Pilate handed him over. Before Jesus was crucified, he was whipped. Do you know the morning, it was morning when Jesus was whipped? Do you know that morning it was quite chilly? It was cold that morning. Mm. Well, how do you know it was cold that morning? Because just a few hours before, Peter was warming his hand over a fire of coals. Mm -hmm. And so it was chilly that morning. And so I don't know if you've ever had something hit your skin when you're cold, how much more sensitive your oh, skin yeah. is. Mm -hmm. Well, it was in the morning where he would be whipped. And I guarantee you that morning mm -hmm. that Satan had the two best floggers in the Roman government ready, the strongest, ready to do what they were going to do to Jesus that morning. Mm -hmm. And so, he was whipped over and over and over again. 
Well, didn't he just take 40 stripes? No, he didn't take 40 stripes. That's the Jewish punishment. No, the Roman punishment is they whip you until they're tired or you died. And so, at the end of this whip were fragments of bone, of metal, of glass. And they whipped his back over and over again. Why? Because he loved you so much. Mm -hmm. Loved you. He took it for you. And then he had to carry his own cross across that back that's been opened. And falling down many times, finally he could not get back up again. And someone had to carry that cross. And he went to Mount Calvary and he stretched out his arms. And spikes were driven through his wrists where the most painful nerve endings are in your body. And it was driven to his feet. And he hung there in front of a multitude, absolutely with no clothes on at all. And he did it for you. Mm-hmm. To love you. And he gave it all. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Look at 1 Peter 2.24. The physical sufferings wasn't really the bad part. It was what was happening in the spirit at the time. 1 Peter 2, look at verse 24 says, who himself, Jesus, bore our sins in his own body on the tree. On the tree, all your sins were put onto the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. The sins that you think weren't much and the sins that you were so shameful and you feel so shamed, you're still so guilty for, those those things that you've done that that you have to keep busy because if you get quiet, it comes up and, and your guilty conscience comes to you. He bore that in his body. He did it for you. He did it for you, by whose stripes you were healed. And so God wants to demonstrate to you today, fresh, His love. He wants to heal you. He wants that financial need. But it's going to flow from the cross where His blood paid for it. And so if you want to experience the love of God and go back to know His heart for you and to know the depths, do you think Jesus uh, went through all of that He's going to withhold healing from you. The whole reason he was horrifically whipped was for your healing. Do you think the suffering on the cross that he did, he withhold your, your rent or, or your needs being met? You don't know the heart of God. Mm-hmm. So go back to the cross. Mm-hmm. And God wants to have a fresh demonstration of his love. And what you're going to experience, what he prayed for came from the cross. Last thing I want to look at you need to verbalize his love for you. Make it personal. This is what I think one of the secrets of John the Apostle John. Out of all the disciples, he was the closest. He was the one that leaned his head on Jesus' breast at the supper. He knew Jesus. Mm-hmm. He rested on the love of Jesus, his, leaned on his breast, his heart, and heard his heart beat. John five times, five stands for the number of grace. Five times John verbalizes God's love for him. Look in John 13, look at verse 23. It says, Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Mm -hmm. This is found only in the book of John. You know who wrote the book of John? John. Mm -hmm. John wrote the book of John, and he will five times bring out that he was the disciple whom Jesus loved. Mm -hmm. And so he says, whom Jesus loved. Look at John 19, look at verse 26. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved... Standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. John 20, look at verse 2. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where he had laid him. John 21, verse 7. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It's the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard it, that was the Lord, he put on the outer garment, for he had removed it and plunged into the sea. And then finally John 21, look at verse 20. Then Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following, who also had leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, who is this, the one that betrays you? Five times he says, I'm the one Jesus loves. I'm the disciple. You need to say that. I'm the one Jesus loves. I'm the one Jesus suffered for. You're the one God loves. I'm loved by God. Go back and focus on what he did for you at the cross. And the love of God will fill you. And receiving things becomes easy. Lastly, again, put the magnifying glass of God's love over your heart personally. Make it personal. How much does God love you? Look at John 17, last verse. John 17, 26. How much does God the Father love you? It says, And Jesus said, I have declared to them your name, 
and will declare it. And the love with which you love me, Jesus was talking to his father right now. It was this high priestly prayer in John 17. And Jesus said, the love with which you loved me may be in them. You know how much God loves you? The same exact love he loves Jesus. He loves you. Because that love sent his son to the cross. That love sent and watched his son suffer because he wanted you. And that love is available to you to receive right now. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for those out there listening today that seem to be struggling to receive healing or struggling to receive their financial needs met or a victory or freedom. But Lord, they're looking for love in all the wrong places. Lord, I pray that they would go back to the cross and meditate on the cross and Holy Spirit, you would bring reality in that. I thank you for the love of God springing from the cross, a fresh demonstration of the cross and the love of God in, in the form of healing and provision would flow from the cross where Jesus' blood paid for it. And Father, I thank you, Father, that they'll get to know you in a greater way and trust you and know in whom I believed and trust he's able. Father, I thank you for it in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. That was so powerful. Thank you, Pastor Rick. Amen. Praise God. Um, you can just feel the love of God for you. And there's so many good questions, but I just wanted to quickly say that, you know, that focusing, shifting your focus on what Jesus did for you and what God did for you, because I feel like it's so easy to get your focus on yourself. And what am I doing wrong? Mm -hmm. Why do I feel faith this faith. way? Yeah. yeah. Faith in your actions, mm -hmm. faith in what doing, you comparing yourself to other people. Mm -hmm. But it's so easy to receive when you just believe. Just like that small child. No, knowing the love of the parent comes right in and just says, thank you for dinner, Daddy. Yeah. And, and just walks right in and takes takes what's already been provided in the refrigerator. Amen. It's easy. B bypasses the, the sofa with the two lampstands and just <laughs> receives. That's awesome. Yeah. That's funny. Oh, well, thank you so much, guys. And thank you for the questions coming in. Um, so I'm going to start with Sharon on YouTube. She says, how do I have faith to hold on during difficult times when it seems impossible to focus on the word? Well, it goes back to when, you know, Paul was having the most difficult storm in his life. And so it's focusing on the Lord. It's like, I know him. Mm -hmm. You know, it looks like if I look at the natural, then unbelief's being ministered. If he looked and focused on the natural, there was no hope. Mm -hmm. He says, matter of fact, actually, all hope, natural hope was taken from us. Mm -hmm. But God. And so he just focused in and focusing on him. And so I think sometimes your circumstances are yelling at you in such a way that there are times where you need to take authority over it. Mm -hmm. Take authority over those voices trying to grant the, you know, I remember Kenneth Hagin talking about that he was, had a visitation of the Lord Jesus and Jesus was actually talking to him and all of a sudden a demon came before him, kind of put a smoke train and it was up, yeah, kick, 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 and it was making all noises mm -hmm. and he couldn't hear what Jesus kept talking, mm -hmm. but he couldn't hear. And finally he's like, I got to hear what Jesus is saying and say, Satan or devil, you go in Jesus name. Yeah. And that devil just went and Jesus went on talking and he says, I'm glad you did that because if you didn't handle that, I I couldn't have because mm. I gave you authority. And so sometimes the enemy's coming in and trying to make a big clatter. You need to take authority and say, shut up in Jesus' name. Mm. But then you turn immediately, go back to listen to, the, to what Jesus is saying. And so there are times you need to address the enemy, address those things that are yelling at you. But there's most of the time you just focus on the Lord and keep listening to Him. Mm, that's so good. I love what you always say. Keep looking at Jesus. Three steps. Keep Look at Jesus. Keep Keep looking at Jesus. Keep on looking at Jesus. It's true. Yeah. It's simple, but it's true. And it's yeah. funny. <laughs> um, okay, so Samaya on YouTube says, sometimes it's easier to believe for others to receive, like your family and your friends, as opposed, as opposed to believing for myself. I'm more passionate when I'm standing in the gap for others. Why do you think this is so? Well, let's talk about healing. Mm -hmm. When you have symptoms in your body, the pain, that's ministering unbelief. Mm -hmm. The natural ministers unbelief to you. And so, but when you're praying for someone else in pain, you're not feeling that pain. Yeah. You're not experiencing, it's easier for you not to have that hindrance to your faith. So you're able to release that faith. And so sometimes it's, it's good to have someone lay hands on you. And so lay their jumper cables on you <laughs> and, and put your faith and connect your faith with their faith. Now you can receive just directly from you, but you got to deal with the unbelief. And so Jesus said, you know, uh, you got to deal with unbelief because un unbelief, you know, uh, the man who tried to get his son healed that was throwing itself and having epileptic fits. 
He says, I believe, help my unbelief. Mm -hmm. So you can have faith and unbelief at the same time. And they counteract one another. Unbelief comes from looking at the natural. Faith comes from looking at Jesus. And so, so if you can deal with the unbelief and get that dealt with yourself, then you can receive by faith. But sometimes it's helpful to get someone else on the outside that's not going through what you're going through, looking at what you're looking at, experiencing what you're looking at, and their faith doesn't have that obstacle. And that's why sometimes it's good to have the body of Christ. Yeah. And if you need a prayer, there's a prayer partner there today filled with yeah. the faith of God for your situation. Maybe you're struggling. Don't get in condemnation. You, you should grow to the place to where you can deal with that unbelief yourself, get healed by yourself. But until you're there, you've got the body of Christ. And so call prayer line 719-635-1111. There's prayer line 24-7, a prayer minister there that's going to put their faith with your faith and, and, and just focus on the love of God and receive from the love of God today. Amen. Praise God. And so, Pastor, you spoke a little bit about personalizing God's love for mm -hmm. you. And so I love this question from Pamela on YouTube. What are the best ways that we can personalize Scripture? The best way is to speak. Mm -hmm. Speak first person, present tense. For instance, when the Lord says, you, that the, in the Bible says that um, you're a new creation in Christ Jesus, and the next verse also goes on, verse 21, it says that he who, who was, knew no sin was made to be sin, that those might become the righteousness of God. So God calls a believer the righteousness of God. Well, if God says that over you, you need to personalize that and say, I am, present tense, not I'm going to be, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And the first time you say that, it's like taking a shower with your socks on. It's very uncomfortable. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's because your mind's not renewed to that. But you need to keep saying it. Why do you need to keep saying it? Because I feel so fake. Well, the reason you keep saying it because God says it and He's the author of reality. And so humility, basically you want a fat, you want a worm holder to humility. You want the fastest route to humility, agree with God. Amen. Whatever He says, agree with Him. That's humility. And so God says you're the righteous of God in Christ Jesus. So you need to say, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Keep saying it. Keep saying it. And what goes from here, all of a sudden it drops down there one day, oh, I am mm -hmm. the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And then your life outwardly will change more than ever by on purpose. Mm -hmm. And so again, you just need that revelation of who, what God says you are already. And so how do you personalize it? You need to speak first person, present tense, I am the disciple whom Jesus loves. Mm -hmm. It's not, well, He loves everybody. No, He loves me. Mm -hmm. He died and suffered for me. He bore my sins at the cross. Mm -hmm. By His stripes, I am healed. Make it personal. Mm -hmm. And uh, especially at the cross, realizing that in a God way, I don't understand. Personally, He's your personal Lord and Savior. He personally died for you. He personally took your sins. He personally did it for you. You had an individual Savior, and He died for you as an individual, and He had you on His heart. Only He could have done that. And so, make it personal that way. I love that. And you know, something that it just the Lord reminded me this week is that there are so many promises in the Word of God. For individual for, for us and it's hard to remember them every day and to remember all of his promises and I have a little confession card that I have and I was reading through it maybe for the first time in several months and so many scriptures that I had written down mm -hmm. encouraged my heart and encouraged my faith that I was speaking over my life and I was like oh I forgot about that one I forgot about this one and the Lord just reminded me like we need to write down the ones that matter to us or the yeah. ones we're believing the whole for. Highlight, the Holy Spirit highlights yeah. certain ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amen. And encourage yourself in the promises. Amen. Amen. That's awesome. Um, so Vanessa on YouTube says, a faith problem is a relationship problem, which is what you said. So how do we solve this relationship problem? And you touched on several things that we can do. But she says, every day I listen to live Bible study, I pray and I pray in tongues. I have faith in God, but I think I only have intellectual knowledge. Yeah. I think that brings out a problem. Wonderful question. Mm -hmm. I think the problem with many of the body of Christ today is we're having a relationship with God by proxy. Mm -hmm. Like Israel, uh, God was speaking to Israel and Israel says, no longer let God speak to us. Moses, you hear from God and we'll listen to you, Moses. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of the body of Christ is living their Christian life by proxy. Why am I saying this? They're living off TV dinners. <laughs> what does that mean? Have you ever had a TV dinner versus a home-cooked meal? 
<laughs> well, a TV dinner for a Christian is watching their favorite speaker on TV. Mm -hmm. That's great to listen to live Bible study. Please listen to live Bible study. It's great to listen to Andrew. Listen to Andrew. I listen to him today on the way up. Every morning I'm on the podcast. And so he's just finishing up on the seven steps to victory. And so I listen to other ministers. But you need to spend time alone with God with your Bible, inviting the Holy Spirit to reveal yourself. And you hear from God. Mm -hmm. And so many Christians don't have a personal relationship with God. They're having the relationship of God through ministers. Mm -hmm. And it's so easy to do that today because of the internet. Mm -hmm. You can listen to who's who around the world anytime you want to. And so often we're filling that up by proxy, but we're not spending our own time with God. And so your time through listening to this, this program here does not substitute for your own personal time with God. With you reading the Bible, asking the Holy Spirit to speak to you, you praying to God and then having fellowship with Him, that's how you get to know somebody directly, not indirectly. And so again, hear me say, do not stop listening to, the, to your pastor. It's good to have a church. I am one. I am a pastor. Mm -hmm. So please don't leave church. But you need your own personal relationship with God. And I see that today. So many Christians do not open the Bible for themselves. They're not spending time alone with God. But they're trying to live the Christian life through other ministers. And so again, that's how you're going to not just be intellectual. It's going to be of the heart. Amen. Amen. That's awesome. That's, well, that's a word of the wise. That's, I gave the word and you're wise. So. <laughs> Amen. Amen. All right. I think we have time for one more question. So, Tumali on YouTube says, how do you know if you're sensing the grieving of the Holy Spirit versus if it's self-condemnation? Well, I think when, whenever we sin and we feel guilty about it, that's not really the Holy Spirit doing that. That's our own spirit that's telling us, you violated my nature. You violated love. And that's that sick feeling in the pit of your stomach. Mm -hmm. But sometimes Satan wants to help out and he wants to beat you over the head with thoughts and stuff like that. And you're no good. And, and so that's never from God, especially what brings you to run from God or be afraid of God or God doesn't want you anymore to separate you from his love. That's the devil. And so you need to resist that in Jesus' name. Go back to the cross. No, look back to love. No, he died for my sins. The sin I just committed, Jesus it was in his body. He took a beating for that. He died. He bled out for that. And so he's forgiven me. And I receive that today. And so again, whether, whether it's your own heart that's condemning you, greater, God's greater than your heart. He's greater than the devil. And so just speak to the enemy. Tell him where he needs to go. But then just receive that fresh demonstration of forgiveness. Receive forgiveness fresh from the cross. And, uh, and you'll find victory. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Well, thank you. Thank today. you. This was fun. Amen. And powerful. I, I know that that was such a blessing to so many people who are watching today. So thank you again, Pastor Rick. Amen. And thank you guys for joining us. And we will be back for Kira's Daily Live Bible Study Monday morning at 10 a.m. So y'all have a great weekend. Be blessed. <laughs>